we're ready to cut these pants. Could I give you my way of thinking about cutting? I, first of all, do an initial rough layout with my muslin pieces to see how much fabric I need. This is that red silk taffeta that we will be using for the entire garment that you saw on Tony, which my workroom is cutting right now. So I have not divided this fabric, so to speak, yet. In other words, I'm preserving grain. Remember, that trouser is completely on the bias. This is my pattern. And notice, please, how with bias, I always leave a selvage and a cross grain so I know exactly what I'm doing when I place that muslin onto my fabric for the initial tryout. That is the center front of the trouser. This is the center back. And of course, I keep adjusting the pieces until I get the best layout to have the most advantageous use of the amount of the fabric. And if I move this way, I'm able to fit this back piece in. And at this time, I would, and notice again, please, how I am lining up the salvage grain with the salvage. Now here on the front piece, we may have to piece a little bit, but I don't think that would ever be seen. This bias trouser does have a third piece, and of course, unfortunately, I can't get that out. So we're going to have to think of more fabric somewhere along the line. I do remember that I have my waistband pieces, and of course I place those where it will work very advantageously for me. Now here, for instance, is an area where you might be thinking those little skinny spaghetti straps. All right, now that's giving me an idea of how I'm going to place this pattern. The next thing I do is to take that pattern off, and I divide these equally. So I have given myself a cut here, and when it comes to wovens, I never ever think of ripping that fabric, of tearing it, and I wish you wouldn't. I pull a thread, and I very carefully cut. To me, pulling that fabric, tearing it, is a sin, and I don't think you should do it because you get these fibers very, what will I say, so heavily concentrated that for, to my way of thinking, a good inch of the fabric is ruined. So take a little bit more time, won't you, when you're working with a good woven and pull that thread until you're all the way across. Remember, I'm not thinking of fast sewing in this couture session here at Iowa State University. We're doing it very, very much the pure couture way. Another thing you notice before I finish cutting there, that I had folded this over to get the rough layout. But please be very careful. You don't want to think of placing your pattern on that fold, so to speak. In other words, in my workroom in New York, we are always cutting in the same direction. And I always give myself some kind of a mark on such a fabric as this silk taffeta, which has two sides looking the same, to know invariably what is the right side. We use a different colored thread with a knot. That indicates our right side. Now, what I'm trying to say to you is, I've got all of this going in one direction so that I've given myself another knot here so that I don't get mixed up and have two different up and downs. You may not think that's always important, but I feel it is. Certainly, if you're working on a velvet or a satin, you can ruin your garment if you are turning that back. So please, won't you do what I do? Always keep it going in one way. All right, now by pulling this thread, we are finishing. And the next process, which I would like you to remember with whatever fiber you're working with, silk, cotton, wool, linen, especially the wovens, especially the naturals, excuse me, especially the naturals, but even such a fabric as, fiber as Kiana, I always go to the ironing board, and it's high time I got rid of this jacket. I'm in the workroom, am I not? I go to the ironing board, and I give these two pieces of equal length fabric what I call a steam bath. 
I've left the sleeve board here. I feel to do a great garment, you must have a sturdy ironing board, a good steam iron, a very sturdy sleeve board, and a mitt, not a ham. What identifies the mitt is this pocket, a mitt that with that pocket, you can slip onto the end of that sleeve board and we can work sleeves, we can work bust areas where we're holding in the fiber, those necklines that I talked to you about that we hold in. We work those on the round of this ham and you can shrink out all of that ease, of course, easier in the natural fibers. Now, this is what I mean by a steam bath. With this fabric on grain, right side down, I'm, yes, right side down, wrong side up to me, I give this what I call a steam bath. I get all of the steam I possibly can, and people, I'm not working above, I'm working directly on that fabric. Now notice, I am moving all the time, so don't dream. That is indeed when you might burn, but you're not going to burn this with steam if you will really keep moving. And in this way, you get out all of the wrinkles, and more important, you get out the shrinkage, and there will always be some in natural fibers. I don't feel it necessary that you wash this beautiful silk, but I indeed feel it necessary that you give it this steam bath. Notice how I am directly on this fabric moving all the time. I do let it dry momentarily before I move it to the next section. In this way, doing this initial process, should you send a garment to the cleaner or should you wash it if it is a washable fiber, if you have not done this, the cleaner is certainly going to use a heavy steam iron, and that is when that garment will start pulling up. And it really is not his fault then if you have not done this. So please, again, thinking the couture way, will you give the fabric this heavy steam bath? Now, let's say that I have done both of these pieces. I come back to my very flat working surface and dear people, it must be flat or you're not going to get a good garment. And here I'm thinking of those trousers and they are unlined. So it is important that you bear with me that we're thinking an unlined trouser as we are cutting. I line up my selvage with the edge of my table. I forget the cross grain. Invariably, it's going to be a little bit off. Don't force it back. Remember with this piece, I'm right side up to me wrong side down. I take my second piece and I have my knot to show what is the right side and I'm the knot here and of course I want the knot here, not reversed. This way I know I'm going in one direction. And again, I line up very, very carefully thinking always of that selvage. Your cross grain, I ignore it. No matter how expensive the fabric, I find that cross grain is usually a bit off. One time when I worked on 7th Avenue, we would try to force that fabric back with the steam iron on the cross grain. I feel that that's not right. Flat, 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 please, huh? And as you notice, I'm in a rectangle, so everything at the moment is grain, and that's where I want you to concentrate. I now take my pins, if he knew what he did with them, and I very carefully pin those two pieces of fabric together all the way around. I'd say about an inch and a half apart. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go all around, but you're going to think, please, that I am all the way around. I'm going to just put a pin now and then, but as I said to you, I should be not more than an inch and a half apart with these pins around the edges, not in the center at all, but I am impeccably flat. Now, with all of that pin around the four sides, I take my tracing paper, and I don't quite know what happens here at Ames and Iowa State University, but in New York, you can buy these large pieces of tracing paper. You can get them in red which is ideal for muslin. You can get them in yellow, again, ideal for muslin. 
and you can get them in navy, again ideal for muslin, or you can get them in white, which is what must be used for your fashion fabric. Please don't ever mark your fashion fabric with one of the colors. It stays in forever. A cleaner can't get it out. Now, having said that, will you bear with me because somewhere along the line I'm on a tour and somewhere along the line I have lost my other sheet of white. So I'm doing what I ask you not to do, but I'm only giving you the method here. Can we think of this as a white sheet? And I get those sheets very flat under me. Remember, they're called tracing paper. In New York City, I buy them retail for 30 cents a sheet, so you're not breaking the budget. And if you will keep them flat, they really can stay with you a long, long time. So here I am, remember, pinned all the way around with these two layers. And I remind you, we're thinking an unlined garment. In this instance, a trouser. And I place my pattern pieces exactly the way I had them. Again, aligning them with these selvages so that I'm not thinking bias at the moment. I'm thinking grain, meaning selvage with selvage. Here, in this instance, I've left the selvage and the cross grain. And I'm asking you again to think in terms of inch and a half seam allowances everywhere, not five eighths of an inch. I don't feel that's enough. If you will do inch and a half, if we need to let out, we have that fabric. After I have fit, stitched, pressed, then I trim those seam allowances to say uh, a half inch. I find this tracing wheel the ideal situation for me. Remember, please, I'm not thinking of the tracing reel that has those long spokes. That's only for very, very heavy wools. This one has a very fine, uh, what will I call it, indentation, so that you do not cut into a beautiful silk because you must be pressing rather hard. And watch my fingers, how I have learned to put three of them down so this fabric does not move under me. Couture takes time, but where I can save time, I save time. I don't find it necessary to pin in here if I've got these three fingers holding with me. And I never pick up my eye as I am wheeling. And I'm very, very careful to see that I move the fingers along with me. And as you notice, I use muslin as my pattern. I wish you would go from paper to muslin meaning that if you want to do a couture garment via a Vogue or Simplicity or Budrick or McCall pattern, that you would trace that first onto muslin, fit it, and use one half of the muslin as your pattern that you could keep for years and it would be to your anatomy. I find muslin a great, great help. I'm hoping the camera can pick up that dart, which I explained to you in the semi-fitting on Tony. This is the back part of the trouser, and this is that very important little dart. It is in the back part. It is parallel with the inseam, which is right here. It is about an inch from that inseam, and it is about three and a half inches long. Whether you are doing, as I said, a pants for a man or a woman, I feel that little dart is going to do everything in the world for you. Now, I'm perhaps juggling that table when I shouldn't have, but I want to rewheel this. And of course, you realize that with the tracing paper under me, I'm picking up all of these marks on the other side. And of course, I'm pinned right sides together with the wrong side up to me. Now, will you visualize, please, that I have done the, the front of the trouser in exactly all of this wheel manner. Because now I pick up my pattern pieces and on this side, I now have all of those marks showing very, very definitely. I leave the pins in and I turn over to the other side. And again, I line up my selvage with the edge of my table and now I see all of the wheeled marks on this side. 
Remember, please, forget the yellow. You should be in white. And I'm now ready to wheel those marks onto the other side of the garment. I find this the surest, the quickest way to cut. You see, this is bias, but I have not cut into any of that bias grain because the minute I do and I start handling it, it's going to stretch. By preserving the grain, doing it this way with this rectangle, I do preserve the grain and I preserve, preserve that bias. Now, whether it would be a skirt or a trouser, and you have to visualize, please, as though I have wheeled all of this, it is, it, it is at this time, before I cut into the, any of the fabric, that I am ready to do my thread tracing, and we're going to halt right for a moment and let you catch your breath while I do some more threading of the needles, and we'll come right back. Remember, please, that we have marked this bias trouser. I'm now, re and I'm st remember, I'm still pinned all the way around. I'm removing the tracing paper, these large sheets, and I'm ready to hand baste that bias seam. You see, I feel you must hand baste bias seams if we're going to do a very decent couture job. You simply cannot stretch, which I want you to do with the bias seams once you're at the machine, you cannot stretch if you have pinned. You cannot pull those pins through the, uh, through the machine. So I'm hand basting. I do start with a knot. And if I were doing a skirt or a dress with a long bias seam in the front, say, I would exactly be doing this same process. I start with a knot. I go just a few stitches. In this instance, we can go up to the dark because we would not be doing too much stretching until there. I cut my thread, and I no longer use a thread for that bias seam because, remember, in this long muslin, say, of this dress, as I said to you, I want you to stretch that seam like mad once you're at the machine. This shows you why you must have hand basted these two together so that you can stretch like mad as you're stitching at the machine and that there are no knots to hold you. So that is the reason why I hand baste these bias seams in sections. Remember, I'm on the back of this trouser and I'm at the crotch area. So I can hand baste this before we even cut into the fabric and in that way I have preserved the grain. And I would say I usually based about, oh, oh, four or five or six inches. And I then cut my thread. And you notice I'm basting, hand basting right on the stitching line. I cut that thread, no knots. And I go over a couple of the threads so that as I am stretching at the machine, all of these unknotted threads give with me and let me stretch that bias most comfortably. Notice too, please, that I'm not doing very long stitches. I'm doing more like an enlarged eighth of an inch here. Sometimes in the seminars, such as I'm doing here at Iowa State University for the clothing and textile department, or the textile and clothing department, I believe, is the correct way, I find the participants giving me very long half to quarter of an inch bastings and that drives me up the wall if we're thinking couture. Please, no more than these enlarged eights. And again, I'm going to be cutting my thread and doing another section. And you see how I try to hold my fingers firmly on this fabric so it moves as little as possible although you can do a number of stitches in this instance. If you're putting in a zipper by hand, I beg you not to do the number that I'm doing here, one stitch at a time. But here you can do a few more. Now when I get to the very top of this seam, there I do want you to go over a number of times, just as I'm going to show you in a second, so that we hold the fit right there. Go over it, anchor it very, very firmly. 
You see, with all of these unknotted hand bastings, once you're at the machine, they're all going to give with you as you stretch these bias seams. And of course, as I see it, all of this sewing and designing and construction is common sense. And remember that on the body where there is no seam, that bias is going to stretch with you on this woven. And that's why when you're doing long bias seams, I feel at the machine, you must stretch them. Bias, I find it the most fascinating of all cuts. And people so often ask me, what kind of fabrics do, what, does one use for bias cutting? I find most of them. 